Hello, everybody. Welcome to Marine Mammal Monday, our Sea Otter Spectacular Edition. So welcome, welcome, everybody, as you're coming on in. Today is an extra special version of Marine Mammal Monday because we are celebrating Sea Otter Awareness Week. That's right. It is the best week of the entire year this week. So started yesterday and it'll go up through the end of the week. Make sure that you think everything otter in the world because today we are here to celebrate our sea otters. Now, as we have folks trickling in, feel free to put in the comments if where you're tuning in from, if this is your first Marine Mammal Monday. Um, and again, welcome to everybody for Marine Mammal Monday Sea Otter Spectacular. So let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you knew that Sea Otter Awareness Week was even a thing. And if this is your very first or you're returning to Marine Mammal Monday. So welcome everybody. I'm starting to see some names coming in. So hello, Linda. Nice to see you. Hello, Rita. Glad that you're here too. It's very exciting. Thanks everybody for coming in and joining us today for this very special Marine Mammal Monday, all about sea otters and how spectacular they are to celebrate our Sea Otter Awareness Week. Oh, welcome, welcome. I'm seeing some more names coming in. So welcome to Jonah from Pataluma. Welcome to Janet from San Ramon. Oh my goodness. Welcome to Sean from London. First time watcher. Thank you so much for joining us here today. You picked a very good one because we're talking all about sea otters, which of course are the cutest. Hello, Stephanie from Vacaville. Excellent. Oh, welcome, welcome. Nice to see you here. Good to see you in our virtual setting here, Steph. And welcome. We see Joanne um, from Washington. First time as well. Oh my goodness. Excellent choice, everybody coming in. Um, you made it to a great Marine Mammal Monday because this is all about sea otters for Sea Otter Awareness Week. Hello to Sea Otter Savvy. Excited to see you here. So glad you could join us today. We're going to talk a little bit more about Sea Otter Savvy as we continue the broadcast. They are an exceptional group. Hello to Kat from Pasadena. Hello. We've got so many folks coming in today. This is so exciting. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming in today. I'm really, really excited. So we'll go ahead and dive right in. Feel free, again, to continue telling us where you're tuning in from. We love when we get to see how far our reach goes for these Marine Mammal Mondays. So as you're, you're typing in where you're tuning in from, and if this is your first Marine Mammal Monday, I'm going to go ahead and get us started because we are here for a sea otter spectacular together. Now, as we start our sea otter spectacular, I am tuning in. My name is Crystal and I am here on site in Sausalito, California at the Marine Mammal Center. Now, if this is your first time, you might be a little bit more curious to know who we are here at the Marine Mammal Center. So I'm going to do just a little brief introduction here. Now, as we get started, I did say that my name is Crystal and I am joining you here as our public programs coordinator. We also have a special guest today. Sandrine Hazan is going to be joining us as our colleague um, out of Monterey Bay Aquarium, which I'm very excited for. And then we also have Katie managing that comment box. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in there. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Now, the Marine Mammal Center is a global leader in marine mammal health, science, and conservation, and is actually the largest marine mammal hospital in the entire world. Now, here at the Marine Mammal Center, we are a nonprofit. So even though we have a small but mighty staff team that's here doing our hardest work, we really rely on the incredible force of volunteers that really drives the work that we do here. So we have about 1,300 volunteers that make everything that we do possible. Now, as we're doing this, we actually cover a huge span of space as well. So even though 1,300 volunteers sounds like quite a bit, we cover about 600 miles of California coast, up from Mendocino County up in the north, all the way down to San Luis Obispo in the south. So anywhere along that space, you can go ahead and give us a call anytime you see a marine mammal in need. In fact, that is what starts our process when it comes to rescuing these marine mammals. We really rely 
rely on folks just like you to let us know if you see anything that might even give you a little bit of pause so that we can send out a team of highly trained volunteers to assess that situation. Now, when you give us a call on our hotline number, which I have posted for you at the top there, um, it's a 24-hour number, so feel free to call whenever. And that number is 415-289-SEAL. Tried to make that last bit a little bit easy to remember. And when you call that number, we'll send out again that team of volunteers. And that's what you're seeing on the top left-hand corner there is some of our volunteers in the midst of a rescue. Now, we'll always be bringing tools that can help keep us and those animals safe. So we might be bringing things like nets that you can see here and things like those rescue boards that help us to safely, again, bring those animals here on site to Sausalito at our main hospital. Now, we are a hospital, so anything you can do at a human hospital is something that we can do here as well. So up in the top right hand corner, what you're seeing is actually a picture of a sea otter, our animal of the day, getting an ultrasound. So we can do things like ultrasound. We have EKGs, EEGs, basically anything that you can think of is something that we're able to do here as well to best care for each and every marine mammal that comes through our doors. Now, while they're on site, we also want to make sure that we're doing a lot of research. And that's what you're seeing pictured at that bottom left there is our um, lab manager, Carlos, there, who's picturing some of the research we're doing. Now, this is, again, to best innovate solutions to some of the problems that's bringing these marine mammals on site and into our care. But not only for those marine mammals, but thinking about how we can innovate solutions that also help humans, right? We're kind of driven by this dream for a healthier ocean for marine mammals and also humans alike. So this research that we're doing here is going to really be what drives that global ocean conservation that we strive for and look for. And then in the bottom right is kind of our ultimate goal here at the Marine Mammal Center. There's a great picture of some harbor seals galumphing their way back out into their ocean home for that second chance at life, that release that we love getting to be able to see and do. And then there's what I get to do, sometimes I call it our fifth R, um, the educational component. So getting to share our stories, getting to get more folks inspired and on board with us here at the center as well. So thank you, thank you all so much for coming to this event, learning more about these animals and spreading the word as well. If you're looking for more of these types of activities, we do have a section on our website, marinemammalcenter.org tab that says education there at the top, where you can find all sorts of different online learning resources, including lots of past Marine Mammal Mondays, um, but also other um, things like curriculum or activities or other things you may be searching for as well. Now on site today and in our care as the Marine Mammal Center, we have about 55 patients with us today. The majority of those are going to be our California sea lions. We're seeing about 45 of those. We have two northern elephant seals. We have a harbor seal, one northern fur seal, and along our range, actually, it extends even into Hawaii. So at our Hawaii location on the big island on the Kona coast, our second hospital called Kei Kaiola, which means the healing sea, we currently have six Hawaiian monk seals as well. And we are also open to the public. So if you saw all of those faces and thought you might want to see some of them a little bit closer, we do have um, space here that is open to the public that you can come and visit and look down onto these animals as they are in the pens, a safe distance away where we can get them healed better to go back out into their ocean home. Now today, though, we are here to talk about everything otter, which I'm very excited about. This is the Marine Mammal Monday Sea Otter Spectacular. Now, I want to start us off by recognizing that this is our Sea Otter Awareness Week. Sea Otter Awareness Week happens as the the last full week of September of every single year. And this is actually the 20th anniversary of Sea Otter Awareness Week. Now, this is a week that is put together um, full of amazing activities and different promotions through a lot of different organizations. Some of the big ones, including um, Sea Otter Savvy, the Defenders of Wildlife, California State Parks, the Elka Alliance, and also Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and this year's theme is really thinking about that path to coexistence, thinking about the positive progression that we've had with coexisting alongside sea otters. We'll dive a little bit more into that later as we go along as well. 
Now, to start us off, I wanted to give us some quick, fun sea otter fun facts. Sea otters are marine mammals, but they are the smallest marine mammal. So they only get to about four feet long. They're about 75 to 100 pounds. Um, and they actually have little paws instead of flippers. Now, with all of these things combined, you may be looking at this illustration of that otter there and thinking to yourself, that doesn't look anything like a marine mammal that I typically think of, right? They look very different from something like a whale or a dolphin, or even fairly different from something like a seal or a sea lion. And that's because they're actually more closely related to weasels and skunks than they are to seals and sea lions. So they've had a very different journey heading back into the ocean. So because of that, their adaptations on their bodies and a lot of the things that you can see are very, very different from what we might think of for a typical marine mammal. One of my favorite things with this is actually their paws. Their little paws don't have any hair or fur on them. So to help keep their paws warm, they actually try to keep them out of the water as best as they can so that they don't get wet and cold. So that's why you might see lots of otters with their little paws sticking up and out of the water. Now I have my favorite fun fact here um, that I'd like to actually ask to you all as a question. So I wanted to ask all of you how much fur you think a sea otter has per square inch. Now to put that into perspective a little bit, a square inch is about the size of a quarter. If you were to make an okay sign with your hand, this space in between is about a square inch or so. So if you were to guess how much fur a sea otter has per square inch, would you think it is A, 400,000 hairs, B, 700,000 hairs, C, 1 million hairs, or D, 2 million hairs? Feel free to go ahead and answer that in the chat. Oh my goodness, I'm already seeing so many answers. I'm so excited. You guys are on this. Okay, I'm seeing uh, a lot of Cs. I'm seeing lots of Cs. That's for 1 million hairs. I'm seeing a lot of 1 million. I'm seeing one for 2 million. I'm seeing one for 700,000. Oh my goodness gracious, all of these amazing answers. Are we ready for the big reveal? It is in fact one million hairs per square inch. So if you were on one million hairs, go ahead and give yourself a little round of applause, a little pat on the back. You are exactly right. And that's a lot of hair on average per square inch. If we were to take that same size and think about the average human head, on the average human head, in that same one square inch, we have up to 800 hairs. No thousands even, only up to 800. So sea otters have lots and lots of hair. Now, really quickly, I did want to also talk a little bit about how this hair has affected their life. Now, because they are actually the hairiest animal in the entire world, um, we found in the 1800s that they were really heavily hunted for the fur trade. So they were hunted to down then less than about 100 individuals during that time. Now, at one point, we even thought they might be extinct. But there was a group or a raft of otters that were found in 1939. Um, kind of off the coast of Big Sur area. And from that about 50 with a couple of others that were found afterwards, that less than 100 has now grown to approximately 3,000 individuals here in California. Now that wasn't exactly on accident, right? This is something that was a great conservation success story that is only made possible because of folks like yourselves. When we all come together, when we work about uh, on these issues that are something we care about, we can make a huge difference together. We were able to vote and create the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1974. Institutions like the Monterey Bay Aquarium, like us here at the Marine Mammal Center, have been working to rehabilitate otters for our almost entirety. So with this coming together, we've been able to really grow that population to about 3,000 individuals, which is a huge, huge success. 
Now you can see here though that we've got a couple of different colors and things going on in this map. So what you can see is off of the coast of California here up into Oregon and where you can't see in Washington, you're seeing a big green line and that big green line is actually the historic range of the southern sea otter. What you see there in red that's going down um, Monterey kind of into Santa Cruz area, all of that is their current range. Now what we think we're seeing a lot here is that they're still a threatened species. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that their range is a little bit small right now. So even though we're doing our very best to get these animals back out into their natural habitats, we need to help them even further and help also with their range and help their range to grow. Now, one thing I really love specifically about our theme this year with Sea Otter Awareness Week and that path to coexistence is Sea Otter Savvy is really working hard to get everyone's voices heard. If you want to help make a difference in the way that we think of otters and sharing that space, um, we're going to put in our comments here a great link that we have to a survey where we're going to post it again a couple of times, but a survey where you can have your voice heard on how you want to see sea otters in your spaces, how we're able to share and coexist or not. So all voices are welcome. We're reaching out to everybody that we can on this stakeholder survey. So thank you again to Sea Otter Savvy for getting all of our voices in together so that we can voice what we think should happen with sea otters. Now, sea otters not only um, are adorable um, and the hairiest, but they also are incredible species. Now, they are considered a keystone species. Basically, that means that they have a really, really big impact on their surrounding habitat and ecosystem. So in the example of something like a kelp forest, which I have pictured here, you can see what it's like with sea otters and without. Now, what we see is that when sea otters are present in places like kelp forests, what they're doing is they're being an excellent predator for something like sea urchins. In fact, they're one of the only predators for sea urchins. If you're unfamiliar, they are these round animals covered in spikes. Um, so they're very hard to eat. Now, sea otters can specialize in this. They teach each other how to do this, where they can actually eat that animal. So when there are no sea otters, since they have very few predators, these urchins will actually eat the bottom of the kelp. They'll eat what's called the holdfast that keeps it on the rock. So as they eat that, it means that that kelp is leaving and floating away oftentimes. So when we don't see sea otters, we see these urchins acting almost like a lawnmower, kind of going through that forest and making it so that it's a much smaller habitat when it comes to the kelp available. Now that means that there's less space for some of these fish that you see or other organisms to use as habitat. So these sea otters are an excellent animal um, because they have a huge impact on places like kelp forests, on eel grass beds. They do a great job as a keystone species, making sure that we have a healthy ecosystem to maintain diversity within it. Now, I know I talked about them eating, and that's because that is something they are very, very good at. So if you were thinking, okay, one or two sea otters, how big of a difference is that going to make? Well, it turns out it is a feast for sea otters. <laughs> now, sea otters eat about 25 to 30% of their body weight each and every day. So on the left-hand side, you can see our, our seafood tower for our otter that about a hundred pound otter would need about 25 pounds of seafood a day. If we were to think about what that's like for humans, about a 150 pound human would need about 37 and a half pounds of food a day. The average medium sized pizza is about two pounds of food. <laughs> so you would have to eat so many pizzas every day. That's almost 19 pizzas every single day to consume as much as a sea otter does, which is pretty incredible when it comes to the amount that they can eat. So they have a huge impact on their ecosystem. 
Because of this, we really think about how we can keep sea otters alive and happy and thriving in their environment. So we take a lot of care thinking about how we might be able to do things like save sea otters. Now we know that there are quite a few threats that they're facing, some of them including maternal separation or being separated from mom too soon. They should be spending about six or so months with mom learning how to be an otter. They can suffer from malnutrition. Maybe they're not finding all of the food that they need in the wild from a variety of diseases. From They suffer from shark attacks. Now, as a fun fact, sea otters are actually not part of a shark's diet. However, sharks are very tactile and they have um, most sensitivity actually on their lips and gums. So occasionally they will bite an otter and being the smallest marine mammal, you can imagine that something like a big shark bite could still be a big issue. But they're also suffering from things like oil spills and human interaction as well. Now, I want to tell you a little bit more about an otter that we had here pretty recently. We tend to get otters every once in a while. So far in our 47 years of experience here at the Marine Mammal Center, we've responded to over 750 otters. So we do get to respond to quite a few otters. So I'd like to share a story of one of them from 2021 named Spinny. Now, Spinny came to us as a male juvenile, um, actually rescued right out by San Luis Obispo. Now, Spinny came in for all sorts of thing, everything under the sun, truly. Um, so we saw him for trauma, anemia, enteropathy, and hyperglycemia. Now, while all of those things are coming in, what we tend to see is that with Spinny in particular, sorry, um, he came in with a big shark bite. So that's what that trauma is referring to. Now I have a little video that I'm gonna play that can show you more about Spinny's care here. And then um, we can come back together. So that's a little bit more about Spinny. I love that last little spin that he gave to the camera, as you might imagine with the name like Spinny. It was mostly because he was very, very good at doing spins in the water. Now, Spinny again was with us for about three months to rehab with us here on site while we helped to treat those wounds, that big shark bite injury. Um, but luckily, we were able to outfit him with a radio tag. So as we sent him back out and released him into his ocean home for that second chance at life, we're also able to learn a little bit more about where he's going, how he's living his life as well, and hopefully getting to recite him. Now, Spinny again is a great example of one of the otters that we were able to care for here. Um, but I realized that I missed a really good question while I was going through this. I saw uh, Donna who asked how they eat such spiky sea urchins. And excellent, excellent question. If you were to look into the mouth of an otter, you might be able to see some of their really, really huge teeth. But what's even better is before it even gets to their mouth, those big spikes are in the way. So these otters are actually going to use tools. They are one of the very few animals that can use tools. So the other one that really comes to mind off the top are things like chimpanzees. So because there are so few animals that use tools, it's a great way that we're able to see some of the ways that they can adapt to their surroundings. So what they'll do is they'll take those animals, those urchins, excuse me, those spiky little balls and they'll use a rock almost like an anvil to smash through some of those spikes so that they can open up the test or the shell of that animal and then they'll slurp up all the goodness on the inside so you can sometimes see um 
some teeth from these animals, these um, sea otters that are almost stained purple from all of the purple urchins that they're eating. So they do love it. They're really, really good at it. Excellent. So now that I've talked a little bit about these animals, the amazing things that they can do, and even one of our own success stories like Spinny here, who was able to get that second chance at life, I did want to talk a little bit more about Monterey Bay Aquarium and some of our colleagues over there. Um, so at the Marine Mammal Center, we are able to house the adult otters, but Monterey Bay Aquarium has a really special program um, to help us with those pups because we can't take the pups. Now I'm going to invite Sandrine Hazan, our colleague from Monterey Bay Aquarium, to come on in to introduce herself, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about that as well. So welcome in, Sandrine. Hello. Hi, Do you mind happy to be us... here. Yeah, thank you so much. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about you and what you do at Monterey Bay Aquarium? Sure. I'm the Stranding and Rehabilitation Manager at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and uh, our focus is on rescuing and rehabilitating sick or injured or orphaned um, sea otters and eventually releasing them back into the wild. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today with us as we celebrate Sea Otter Awareness Week. I couldn't think of a better colleague. <laughs> yes. Now, as we're getting started here, I'd love to ask, and by the way, these pictures are, these next coming photos are all um, courtesy of Monterey Bay Aquarium. So thank you so much for these extra adorable otters. Um, I'd love to ask you first, what is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Sea Otter Program? Well, the sea otter program, as I said, we rescue and rehabilitate otters that are sick and injured um, and orphan. And specifically, these orphan pups, we do have a surrogacy program where once we get them to the point that they're hitting all their, their milestones, which we can talk about in a bit, we have a surrogacy program where we compare them with surrogates, with um, females that live here at the aquarium. Um, in order to show them show them the ropes and how to be a little bit more wild so that we can effectively hopefully successfully release them back into the wild that's amazing <laughs> i'm so excited i can't wait to hear all about it so out of you know just needing to know what is it like to work with the sea otter pups Sea otter pups, as you would expect, are adorable and they're really fun. And obviously it's incredibly rewarding, but it's also challenging. I always say it's not a one pup fits all model. Like each of these pups has their own personality, um, their own, um, they're obviously coming in in different conditions. And so it's very important that we are observant when we're working with them um, so that we can truly cater to their needs. Amazing. I'm so glad to hear that you're also able to take in every single one just as they are with all of their craziness, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, there's no judgment whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, since these are young animals, I was really curious to know also how you keep them from habituating to people, how you might keep them from getting too comfortable with human beings. Yeah, that's a great Great, great question and a great photo um, to, to follow up with. So as you can see, many people refer to this as our Darth Vader disguise. Uh, so we, when we, we are working with pups that are going to be released back into the wild, we wear a helmet, a dark welding mask, and then a black poncho. And pretty much this disguises the human form. Um, and then the other important thing is that we are not speaking to them. Like these are not pets. Um, this disguise, I always say, is also a, a good physical reminder. It's more for the volunteers and for staff than it is for the otters sometimes because it's a really good reminder of how we should be acting when we're working with them and what the end goal is. That's amazing. I love that. It's a reminder for everybody, for the mm -hmm. otters and the humans as well. I'm sure it's got to be a little bit tricky to try to make sure that you're keeping that distance at times. It is. It is really tricky because we do have to work with them so closely. When you get a young pup, they're being bottle fed. You're having to groom them since they're not be able to productively groom themselves. Uh, so there's a lot of time spent in there with them. And so anything we can do to reduce the potential for habituation and imprinting is, is very important. Thank you. 
Now, I am a little bit curious. You mentioned a surrogacy program earlier and having to hit certain milestones. I'm a little bit more curious about that. So how does this surrogacy program work? So when when we have a pup that strands, let's assume let's assume we get a one day old pup that comes in. Um, we we have a set plan of developmental milestones that we would like for them to hit before we can put them in with a surrogate. And what that means is that they have to be at the point that they are weaned off of formula onto solid food and actually able to forage on their own. That doesn't necessarily mean we're handing them Dungeness crab that's alive and full urchins and things like that. Um, but they have to be somewhat proficient at picking up food off the bottom, recovering it and consuming it. And so there's a lot that goes into that eight weeks to make sure that they can achieve those goals. Once they're at the point that we feel comfortable that they've had an exam, they clear their pre-surrogacy exam, that they're ready to go in with a surrogate, that's when we introduce them to a surrogate in a larger tank. So they start off in a smaller enclosure and then they get moved into a larger tank with the surrogate. And then you start that whole phase of introductions where you're, the, the expectation is that the female is going to be maternal towards the pup. Um, and act as a companion as well so that the pup is not stressed um, and they, they're they working together. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it could be lots of fun to try to pair them up um, and make sure that those relationships are, are nice and easy. I'm sure it can be a little tricky at times. It's a nail biter at times, yes. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> um, and with that, I was actually curious what pups might be learning from you and your team versus moms. And it sounds like a lot of those basic skills before getting there, right? Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of the basic skills. Some some of the skills are innate. Um, some of the grooming behaviors are innate, but they it takes them a while to become like very proficient and like productive at grooming or productive at foraging. And so once they go in with the females, um, they, I mean, they really learn so much. Obviously, they're mimicking behavior, um, and and mom is like showing them how to open up food, how to open up live prey, because it does get to the point that we we do not crack the food open for them. We're not giving it to them on a half shell, um, so they have to learn how to do that. And the other really important thing that they learn from mom are like social dynamics and interactions. Once they're bonded, we can introduce other animals to the group. So other juveniles or sub adults. And this is, this is something very special that we can, that we can offer. And then they can interact with different um, age groups, even like maybe another pup pair, which is always really fun to see. And then mom will like call a timeout. Like if the rough housing gets a little bit too much, she grabs the pup and she's like, all right, that's it for now. You need to settle down. But, but they, it's really, it's great to watch and it's so important for them. And I think it's a really important part um, that helps to make them successful. That's amazing. I'm so glad that you're able to do so many different things too, to really like play with those social dynamics as well. That can be, I'm sure, really important towards getting them ready for release out in the wild. And with yes. that, I'd actually love to ask a little bit more about release. I know that's kind of both of our ultimate goal here. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, the next phase. <laughs> there are multiple phases and release is obviously the goal. Uh, so for these for these surrogate reared pups, they go through a two week post release monitoring period um, once they are ready to be released. And I mean, you can you can understand that these pups, especially if they come in as a one day old, they don't really know what the wild is. Um, I mean, we try our best with enrichment and things that are you know as natural as possible and live food and other otters, but from a tank to a kelp forest, it's it's very, very different. And so sometimes the releases, it may take like a couple releases, two or three releases before they're actually successful because they're spending a lot of time trying to figure out where they are, what they should be doing, who's that other otter that they don't know. And during that time, they're not foraging, they're not putting on weight. So sometimes we have to recapture them, bring them back for a bit and then release them again. And at that point, there's a little bit more memory and they're not in a sense, wasting time those first 24 to 48 hours because there's some memory of where they were. That's really interesting. I'm so glad to hear that you have that monitoring program for this as well. That is, I'm sure, crucial to make sure that these animals mm -hmm. are going back out successfully. 
I did have one more question I wanted to ask, um, and it was around timeline with the surrogates and the pups. So we got a question in where somebody asked how long they're with their their surrogates. Is there like an average amount of time, or does it really depend on the pup? No, that no, that's a great question. So we we try to keep it comparable with with what it would be in the wild. So a natural weaning age would be approximately six months. So again, if we have this one day old pup at about eight weeks old, that's when we would put them in, in with a surrogate if they've hit those milestones. And so then they're with the surrogate for approximately four months before we wean them. And then usually 10 months, around 10 months or so is when we're shooting for release. Wow, that is amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the work that you're doing there at Monterey Bay Aquarium to make sure that these sea otters have that best chance at that second chance at life. That is really incredible work that you're able to do there. I'm so impressed always with your surrogacy program. And I love that you're able to take your otters that you have there for the public to view and have them also double in as your rehab assistants as surrogate moms. I think that is some incredible double duty there. So thank you. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to tackle some of these other questions that were coming in, um, but I can go ahead and let you go for now. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Sandrine. I really, really appreciate it. Oops. <laughs> Um, now we got a couple of questions that I want to try to take a couple while we've still got a little time. Mark had asked about um, what determines whether a sick or injured sea otter goes to the Marine Mammal Center versus the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And a big, big factor is dependent on the age. So sea otter pups, um, their time with mom is really, really important. And the Monterey Bay Aquarium has this incredible surrogacy program in place to best care for those pups. Now, we, since we don't have otters that live with us full time here on site, the average stay for one of our patients is only about two months. So because of that, we can only take adult otters um, that are sort of ready to go on their own here. Um, so typically age is going to be that main determining factor to decide where they're rehabbing out of. Of course, there are other factors that come into play. No, in, no patient coming into any of our care is ever quite exactly the same and, and as we might expect. So there are many different factors that can take place. I did get another question from LF that asked at the center um, if otters get too used to humans during rehab. And that's very fair. You saw those incredible Darth Vader suits from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Now, what is different here at the center um, is while we may not have that big suit, we aren't getting as close necessarily as they are at Monterey Bay Aquarium. Where Sandrine had mentioned things like bottle feeding them and helping them to groom themselves, those are not things that the otters coming into our care need help with. So here at the center, um, we take a lot of precautions to ensure that our patients and any of our species truly don't habituate to humans um, so that we can release them to the wild. So we'll do things a little bit differently, things like keeping our voices down or not talking at all when we are out and about with any of our patients. Um, whenever we're in the pens, we use these physical barriers, those big shields that we have that we're able to kind of obscure the human figure some, um, but also make sure that there is a barrier between us and the animal at all times. Um, and it is very, very rare. Occasionally, there will be an animal that is non-releasable because of their association with humans, um, but we can make a long-term care plan at that point, working with a couple of different organizations that help us make that, that decision. So we're not too worried about it. Um, excellent. Now, um, I want to say thank you, thank you to everybody for tuning in uh, to our special Marine Mammal Monday today with our Sea Otter Spectacular. We hope that you feel spectacular um, and that you're ready to help support these spectacular animals as well. Now you can do this. You can be an ocean hero. Um, some great steps for this are things like choosing sustainable seafood. Now we did talk a little bit about how much food these sea otters are consuming on an everyday basis. So making sure that we choose sustainable seafood so that we know that there's enough out in the ocean to share for these 
animals that need it out in their habitats and also the 3 billion people on earth today that also rely on seafood as their main source of protein. So some great resources there are the Monterey Bay Aquarium's Seafood Watch app, a great way, um, or excuse me, website is a great way that we can always make sure that we are choosing sustainable seafood. And in fact, this is the guide that we use for our um, seafood that we provide to our patients here on site at the Marine Mammal Center. Or if you are out and about in the grocery store, look for those ASC or MSC sustainable seafood, almost fishy check marks um, that you might see as stickers posted right on that seafood. Um, we want to make sure that we respect the nap. That is one of my all-time favorite catchphrases that we have here um, that is from Sea Otter Savvy. So their, their tagline at Sea Otter Savvy is respect the nap. And basically what that means is that we want to make sure that we're viewing wildlife safely. Please go out, find a sea otter, view them safely from a distance so that we can respect them and their naps that they take or anything else that they're up and doing, um, but also making sure that we're giving them the space that they need to do that. So they are excellent to go out and view. I definitely suggest grabbing some binoculars or even an or even a big camera with a nice zoom lens. Um, within the Marine Mammal Protection Act, we wanna make sure that we are always at least 50 feet away from these animals. And last but not least, share your voice. We talked earlier about that stakeholder survey where we're trying to collect as many opinions as possible, as many people to come into the survey as possible to share your voice about how you feel about sea otters, what you would like to see for sea otters. So head on to the Sea Otter Savvy website or click on the link that we shared um, so that you can take the survey as well. Thank you all so, so much for all of your time um, and coming in to, to see this with us. I see a couple more questions. We're going to do our best to answer those. Um, so take a look on those comments, see if we can answer as many of those as possible. But thank you all again so much for tuning in for this very special Marine Mammal Monday for Sea Otter Spectacular and Sea Otter Awareness Week with our many partners. And thank you again to Sea Otter Savvy for helping to put all of this together. I hope you have an excellent rest of your day and an excellent rest of your week. Be sure that you head out there, have some sustainable seafood for those otters, and fill out that survey. Bye, everybody.